I have a coffee farm in Chinchina, close to Chinchina, Colombia. So when I'm talking to you, please first of all consider I farm my own organic coffee. That's a detail to know. Second, what would be interesting for you to know is that in the year 2000, I had my own pavilion at the World Expo in Hanover, Germany. We had the largest bamboo structure in modern history. And as you probably know, when you have coffee, you have bamboo. They're symbiotic. Coffee is absolutely dependent on the bamboo, because if you have the bamboo, you're replenishing the soil. If you're having the bamboo, then you're securing the hydrology of the system. It's always interesting when people describe the macroeconomic and the macro disasters that are emerging. But let's not forget that if we have bamboo, we are mitigating. So I created this building with Simon Belles from Colombia. And we had 6.4 million visitors at our World Expo. So I know the Expo, and I'm a coffee farmer. As an introduction, let me share with you one of my friends, Elon Musk. And what he says there is to me very important. I like to be involved in things that change the world. Why do anything less? We're here to change the world. And therefore, one of our big initiatives is to really understand how we can more change the world than we're undertaking today. As a way of introduction, let me take you through the history of mankind. About four million years ago, mankind separated from the primates. And we separated, and one of the most important things we did is we went from four legs to two legs. Now, that was a high-risk operation. Why? Because on four legs, you're more stable. On two legs, you're instable. On four legs, you're faster. But when you are only running on two legs, you can carry 15 times more food than you can eat in a day. The result is that now you can come to the nest. You can come to where your offsprings are and you have more food than you can eat. What do you think they do when they see you? We love you. We now know from the, from the Swedish Academy of Sciences that the brain development going from 450 cubic centimeters to 1,500 cubic centimeters in brain has been triggered by the emotional experience of taking risk and getting rewarded. It means the entrepreneurial spirit. The entrepreneurial spirit is what made the difference. You take a risk, but get a reward. But reward is, first of all, an emotional reward, an award of love, of caring, of community. And that then triggered motoric development, tools development, language development. 10,000 years ago, Mankind had the largest brain size ever. In the past 10,000 years, our brain has been shrinking. Very few people talk about that. The Neanderthal had 200 cubic centimeters more brain than we have today. And why is it? Of course, this is a hypothesis because we've lost the emotional experience, the deep emotional experience we need to get back to these emotional experiences. That's perhaps why we need to talk about coffee. Let me give you two examples of projects that we undertake, have undertaken, in partnership with incredible people around the world, so that we can see what is possible as well with coffee. In 1984, I visited this part of Colombia, El Bichada. El Bichada is close to the Venezuelan border in the valley of the Orinoco River. And 250 years ago, this area was totally devastated, deforestated. Don't think what happens today is what is recent. We've been cutting forests. There's 20 million hectares that is pure savanna, 
nothing grows because we cut it to introduce cattle farming in Latin America 250 years ago. Paolo Lugari and a few other people, in 1984, supported by the president of Colombia, Belisario Betancourt, we thought we should regenerate the rainforests. None of us had experience in regenerating rainforests, and so we were declared crazy people. Today, when I'm declared a crazy person, I think it's an honor. What you're seeing here is the NASA photographs, and the red is forest. This is it from the airplane. What used to be a place with only 17 plant species has been converted to an area where there are now 256 plant species. We regenerated the forests, and we still have another 50 to 100 years to go before we're back into the real rainforests. Paolo Lugari has been driving this process now for nearly 40 years. It's long-term, it's visionary, it's clarity, it's commitment, it's doing it. It's not because the science doesn't know it that we therefore can't do it. We're using mycorrhizal fungi, which today you recognize by science. We're tapping the trees. We have the local factory established, contrary to any logic of globalized economy. We're producing colophon for the paper industry and turpentine which is our fuel for all transport. It means we're producing turpentine to have a fuel for our tractors, for our motorbikes, for anything that has an engine, be it diesel or be it gasoline. We use turpentine. Now, when you regenerate the rainforest, then you will regenerate water. And we had the clear policy from the beginning that Las Gaviotas will supply three liters of drinking water for free to anyone in the local influence zone. And second, it was decided that all children as of the age of six will receive a bicycle to transport themselves. We call that the commons. Now what happens when the children drink three liters of water and ride the bicycle? The result is that the hospital that we have constructed in that region had to be closed down for lack of patients. This is real sustainable development. This is entrepreneurship at its best. Because if you have a region where 70% of the people used to suffer from gastrointestinal diseases, and the diseases are gone because you supply water for free, then your land value goes up. This is and economic and social and ecological. This is the kind of logic that we apply. Let me take you a second example before I get into the coffee. As mentioned, we have led and initiated and participated in about 200 projects around the world. One is related to fishing. You know this saying, if you give a man a fish, he will not be hungry for the day. If you teach him how to fish, he will overfish. The problem is that we have been teaching everyone to fish, so we're emptying the seas, but worse. We're taking, as human beings, pleasure in eating caviar. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, I don't understand it. We seem to be the only species on Earth that eats the babies before they're born. I don't get it. We have a fishing system whereby we catch the fish, take out the caviar, and enjoy it. How could you ever be sustainable when you kill the mothers with eggs? The dolphins are a bit smarter. Here you see a dolphin actually releasing air bubbles. When we're fishing, we're catching them with nets. Dolphins and whales, they catch with air bubbles. And we're catching with air bubbles. You don't kill the fish. 70% of the fish in our nets are killed because of the weight of the net. I mean, we have a barbarian system of catching fishes. We just don't realize it because we're insensitive to the collateral effects of our behavior. 
you remember the famous saying of Saint-Exupéry. If you want children to build a ship, don't teach them how to build the ship. Talking about the great voyages they will be making and the best ship will be built. Well, we apply the same logic. Tell the fishermen that they don't have to kill the fish anymore and they don't have to kill the females with eggs anymore and then the best ships will be built. Ladies and gentlemen, two weeks ago we ran our first tests with our catamaran and we're releasing air bubbles underneath the boat to catch the fish. And then we check all the fish through an echographic system and we're securing that no female with eggs gets killed. The females with eggs are released back into the sea. Does it make sense? I mean, a sunfish has 300 million eggs and we kill them. It's no wonder there is an exhaustion in the sea. There's no chance to have any babies anymore. Now, this boat, when you don't have to pull the nets of two kilometers anymore, and when you don't have to freeze the fish immediately because it's already dead when you get them on your boat, in those circumstances, you can have your boat solely running on renewables. This is the Tesla of fishing boats. Now, that's the kind of initiatives that we're involved in. The fishes are processed on the boat into six cash flows, and when the boat comes onto shore, everything can be straight delivered to the market. In order to do things like that, you need mentors. You need people who inspire you, people who challenge you. And I just want to highlight here a few of the people, like Umberto Colombo, the Italians I'm sure will know, or Dr. Aurelio Pecei, Eleonora Massini, and of course, Carlo Petrini. We need leadership at different levels in order to be able to innovate and to go beyond what we think is possible and be very uncompromising. We need not just to know the macroeconomic data, we need to know the entrepreneurial initiatives we can take. Entrepreneurship. I've created 12 companies to win bankrupt. And I do know that entrepreneurship is what will transform. And we don't work with macroeconomic data. We're very uncompromising, and here is my personal experience as well. Some of you may know that I was the owner of a company called Ecova, a company that is the largest biodegradable detergents maker of Europe. We only source renewable oil, but unfortunately I didn't realize in 1991 that this was palm oil. I realized that even though I had an ecological factory in Europe, I was cleaning up the rivers in Europe, but I was destroying the habitat, the orangutan in Kalimantan, Indonesia. That's what triggered me to look for new business models. And that's what questioned me. Going green means paying more because it's good for the earth? I disagree with that. Who invented an economic system? What is good for you and good for the earth is expensive. And whatever is bad for you and for the earth is cheap. I mean, that's an economic system that stands on its head. That can never reach sustainability. So I developed the concept of the blue economy. Now, if blue is not the color of your favorite football team, or it's not the color of your favorite political party, change the color. I don't care about the color. What is important is that I will show you how we can transform the coffee business into a very high value added business, provided we're not obsessed anymore only with cutting costs. We need to desperately, we need to embark on a strategy to generate more value. The value generation is what makes the economy tick, not cutting costs. And the value generation is the challenge to the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur must see new opportunities to see new chances to have more value with that what is already available. I summarized this in the book, The Blue Economy, which is also published in Italian. And I summarized it in a very blunt way. It's a radical change to the business model. If we continue to look at coffee the way you've looked at coffee for the past 100 years, you will only see mergers, as you have seen lately. 
bigger corporations looking for more savings by becoming much more big. Squeezing the farmers and leaving to the consumers to be fair trade and organic. I'm afraid this is not the model of the future. We know that coffee generates a lot of waste streams. You have it at the site of the farm, you have it at the factory site, and you have it as post-consumer waste. It's amazing that only 0.2% of the biomass harvested as the cherry by the farmer is actually consumed, ingested in the body. 99.8% is not consumed. It's considered waste. Emitting methane gas. I mean, I wonder why we don't realize that the fermentation, to just get the husks of the coffee is a major fermentation, is a major methane gas emitting process. It's not about saving the water, it's about what you do with the methane. Now, when you have this kind of a waste, which we all know, and you have that kind of waste, which you all know, then the question is, what value can we generate? Now, when my daughter, this is my daughter, Cheeto, in the picture, she's today 29 years old. She was orphaned because her parents died of AIDS. I adopted her when she was 11. She learned in her coffee region that only the beans is what is of worth. But today, when she goes to talk to the women working on the coffee farms in Chipinge in Zimbabwe, which used to be the marvelous coffee region. When she goes there in Chipinga and tells the women that on the waste of the coffee husks, it's possible to farm mushrooms. And within two weeks, they will have the first harvest. You know what these women do? They get up, they sing, they dance, and they do it. You know what the Europeans need? Business plans, Excel spreadsheets. They need technology audits. They need commissions and pilot projects to check if this is really working. And as a result, we do nothing. Le mal de l'Europe, I'm sorry to say, and our dear American friends are in the same boat, is we want business plans for everything. Now, when I know this works, why do you need a business plan? Just do it. And then we have this enormous desire in Europe to put up all possible regulations. Everything that is permitted in Europe is heavily regulated. And I just want to remind you of these numbers. The Pythagorean theorem had 24 words. The Lord's Prayer is 66. The US Declaration of Independence is 1,300. But the EU Directive on Cabbages is 26,000 words. I mean, we're killing ourselves. I mean, could we not agree on a set of basic principles and move on? Why would you like to spend 26,000 words, and I haven't even said it's translated into 24 different languages. In 1995, we started creating mushroom farms in coffee regions around the world. I'm very happy to note that there is the director of Ceni Cafe of Colombia here, and a very important partner. Since 1996, we have more than 20 peer group reviewed international articles on the social and the ecological impact of farming mushrooms and coffee, both in rural areas and peri urban areas. As you see here, the peri urban region of Manizales in Colombia, and this is Mutare in Zimbabwe. Today, I'm happy to inform you we have more than 3,000 coffee farms, including downtown Paris. If you go and eat Alain Ducasse food in Paris, you will have mushrooms farmed on the coffee waste from Café Les Deux Magots. Doesn't it make sense? Because all the waste is there. Because the 99%, the 99.8% is the waste. And this is what we have post-consumer. We can do it post-consumer, we can do it post-harvest. And this is Laplace, the restaurant chain of the Netherlands, if anyone is here from the Netherlands. Laplace, it's 147 restaurants. All the coffee is put into Egmond, Anse, about a half an hour drive from Amsterdam. 
And the same is collecting every day 400 kilograms of fresh mushrooms for Laplace restaurants. The coffee is turned into vegetarian food that is cheaper than when you fly it in from China. In Rotterdam, anyone here from the Netherlands again, this is an old swimming pool. And I was asked, what do we do with a swimming pool that doesn't meet hygiene standards anymore? And I said, well, if it's a swimming pool, it has temperature control and humidity control. We're collecting coffee waste from the city of Rotterdam. We're farming mushrooms. Now, this works. It actually it works incredibly well. It's now one of the 10 top tourist spots. It is converting coffee waste into mushrooms. We have these kits we have developing in large scale entrepreneurs. In Europe, we have now a club of 80 entrepreneurs who've done this. And it has happened without even the coffee sector noticing. With one exception, Lavazza and Carlo Petrini in 2008 started doing this at Slow Food, the famous festival of Slow Food in Turin. But let me tell you, even my son knows how to farm mushrooms on coffee. My son has learned how to do it at the age of three. Now, if we're talking, talking about the Millennium Development Goals, when you tell my son there is hunger in the world, and he says, well, if they drink coffee, then I will farm mushrooms. And, of course, his mom was born in Colombia, so you can imagine we have a lot of coffee at home. But when a three-year-old knows that it's possible to farm mushrooms on coffee, you've changed the world. Because it means in every home you can do it. And we do it also at home. Whatever we're doing, it has just begun. Because now you've been introduced to the idea that you have a cup of coffee, you have a mushroom. But the waste of the mushrooms farmed on coffee has very rich amino acids, which is great chicken feed. We can beat soy on the world market by using the waste of the mushrooms, which was the waste of the coffee, because of its wealth in amino acids. Now, if you say, I don't have chickens at home, but I do drink coffee, don't worry. Your dog and your cat will also eat it. If you don't have do a dog or a cat, then talk to your neighbor. Patagonia, Adidas, Nike have all introduced sportswear with coffee. Coffee has this incredible cap capability to absorb odors. Our grandmothers knew that. And when there was a bad odor in the refrigerator, she would put in coffee. Today, we have perfected the system. And now, when you buy Adidas clothing or Patagonia clothing, 6% of the clothing will be made from coffee, post-industrial coffee waste. So Café Buendia in Colombia, which is owned by the Federación de Cafeteros, the Coffee Farmers Union, they have started to produce textiles with coffee. Now, we also put it in carpets. Up to 20% of Nylon 6 will be blended with coffee, post-industrial, micron size coffee that allows us to actually generate more revenues than the farmer has ever seen. Why is this important? Because if you want an odor controlling chemical into your carpet, it'll cost you four to five thousand dollars a ton. What do you think is the price for a ton of waste coffee from an instant coffee factory? Today our friends of Nestle, probably they have a about 3 million tons of waste a year. They burn it because they want to save some fuel. And I'm saying you could farm mushrooms, you could have chicken feed, you could have chemicals for textiles, you could have chemicals for... And our dear friends from Nestle, even though I was invited to the board and got the standing ovation from the board for my proposals, the operational managers corrected the board and said, we are not in the mushroom business. We are in the instant coffee business and the Nespresso business. You see where I'm coming from when I say we need a new business model. Today, we can mix coffee oil with MDI to make polyurethane. Polyurethane. 
And today, we mix coffee in paint, because paint is destroyed by the ultraviolet, and we now know that the chemical structure of coffee allows you to diffuse ultraviolet, and therefore your paint lasts for three to four years longer. This is coffee. Is this the coffee you know? Is this the coffee you debate? Is this news to you? And it always goes better and better. Patagonia's new range of shoes in the sole will have 20% coffee. You kick off your shoes, no smell. Are you ready to pay? It means that the coffee business has already become a different business. These are the textiles sold at uh, Juan Valdez in Colombia, only in Colombia, whereby we make the use of the coffee to create sportswear. Now, I just want to say that this is only the beginning. If you think this is already so far, in the journals Nanoscience, which may not be the typical journal coffee people are reading, but Nanoscience have now demonstrated that if we want to store methane gas at high temperatures or hydrogen at low temperatures, the best storage medium is coffee. Because you know coffee is 2,000 chemicals with an extraordinary structure, physical structure, because you first ferment and then you roast. And what we made out of it is an incredible product that it's a shame you only drink it. It's a shame you only drink it. It's a shame that you don't make money on becoming the largest provider to the world of storage systems for methane and for hydrogen. Now, what business are you in? Are you in the coffee business? Or are you in the coffee business? I'm suggesting it's about time you realize that you can increase your revenues by factor 500. That is the real economic impact of coffee, provided we have the entrepreneurs. If you don't have the entrepreneurs, forget about it. Someone else will run away with it. And as long as you think that you should only be busy with coffee to drink, then I'm suggesting you're missing a few opportunities. It's a completely new world. Factor 500 is an amazing number. Now, every single proposal that I have formulated is not an idea anymore. It's technically proven, and the business model exists. So here you see the new dashboard of the Tesla S. Yes, we're expecting Tesla and BMW 7 Series in the dashboard to have 20% coffee. Why? It absorbs the odors. And here is the prototype of a color which you may recognize. It looks like coffee. Yeah. If you put coffee in your Tesla color, then Tesla car color, then you will not decolor like all other colors after 10 years. Ladies and gentlemen, this is coffee. This is what you're dealing with. And I'm urging you that while you are invited to look at the macroeconomic data and get all the numbers that you require and mine that data for your strategic development, I'm inviting you to get down to business. And if you are from a nation that has a lot of coffee, don't think you have to submit yourself to global prices anymore because if you are doing what we know is possible with coffee today, where coffee is cheaper than any chemical that is used either to make polyurethane, it's cheaper than any feed used for the chickens, it is cheaper than the insulation, it is cheaper than what you put in paint. You're highly competitive, you're generating millions of jobs and you're turning coffee into the, one of the most strategic, one of the most strategic products, renewable in this modern world. I'm very happy to be chairman of a company that converts thistles into polymers. Thistles is described as a pest. When anyone calls something a pest, it's because they don't know what it's good for. And then we call it the pest. We have converted this on the island of Sardinia in an all petrochemical factory of ENI 
into the largest biorefinery in the world. We're making six products out of this. But one of the products, of course, we want to highlight is the new capsule of Lavazza. We're making the capsules 100% from a triple-layered polymer made out of fistels. We withstand every single characteristic made out of a thistle that the coffee capsules require in terms of odor, in terms of permeability, in terms of protection. Everything that is required technically can be done with a thistle chemistry, 100% renewable. We don't need aluminum anymore. Aluminum is gone in our minds. We don't need to mine it anymore. We need to harvest thistles. And I just ask you, what's the cost price of a thistle? You actually get paid to harvest it. This is the new economy. And so we're very proud that this work was possible. But you see how from coffee, with the challenges of the new consumption of coffee through these capsules and these machines, we avoid the trap of the aluminum that is going to require more mining and more disasters around the world. We have to work on projects that are worth doing. And by the way, the waste from our thistles can be used as animal feed. And the thistles, they do have a little white flower on top of it, which are enzymes that we use to make goat cheese. Do you see the bioeconomy emerge? This is just not circular economy. This is a radical change of economy. But everything we produce from the coffees, byproducts to the thistle portfolio is highly competitive. And we're doing it at an old petrochemical facility that has been converted to a biorefinery. Ladies and gentlemen, from Latin America, Africa's coffee farming regions to Europe, the old lady, we can transform this economy. I'm convinced we can fundamentally transform it. And let me just share with you, being here in Italy, and I think it's never been shared in public before, that Italy is the first country in the world that has shut down all its crackers. Do you know what it means? The cracker is where you get crude petroleum and you convert the crude into shorter the, those, those shorter, shorter molecules in order to produce whatever you want to produce. Italy is the first country that closes the crackers. Italy was the first country in 1962 to have a cracker installation in Italy. Italy is on the path towards sustainability, and I don't think even the Italian politicians are aware of it. That doesn't matter to me. We have to do what no one has done. And let me therefore conclude a case which is the latest use of coffee. You may have wondered, what does a diaper have to do with coffee? Well, let me explain to you. I just came from Berlin, where I worked with about 100 members of parliament last night. And a city like Berlin has 109,000 babies, and they all wear diapers. 109,000 babies means that there are 125,000 trucks a year delivering diapers and taking the diapers to the landfill. Ladies and gentlemen, it's one of the most wasteful things we've ever done in modern times. Now, we are having it, but we have developed a new collaborative method. We, take, we give the diapers for free. We receive them back. I'm not going to go through all the details. We turn that into terra preta, black earth, because the key is we need more earth, soil. We turn it into black earth, and then the black earth we have, we plant trees. One baby with its diapers and the wonderful content of the diaper. One baby produces a thousand kilograms of black earth per year. That means we can plant 1,000 trees. It means that when the city of Berlin is prepared to collect all the diapers which we are committed to give for free, we will have 100 million fruit trees planted around Berlin every year. The mayor wants it. The city of Paris, Anne Hidalgo, 
the mayor of Paris wants it. What we're seeing is a complete new, but what is now the great absorbent that we're putting into these new diapers? Coffee, of course. Every diaper will be enriched with about 40 grams of coffee. Ladies and gentlemen, did you ever realize that coffee is now going to contribute to the regeneration of fruit forests around cities? Coffee. Why? Because somehow you decided to become a coffee culture, but somehow you decided to do nothing with the waste of the coffee. And again, this is not just circular. This is creating a new economy. Because these are the mountains that you have. And I suspect that even Ili and Lavazza, you have mountains of that. And I wonder if the burning is well, or if you would like to join an initiative where we're planting trees in the city. Here you see the first trees in Berlin planted with the diapers that were recycled into trees. Now what is the big problem? You do this for 25 years, and if you've been doing this for 25 years, in the city of Berlin, you would need to find space for 2.5 billion trees that will be producing 50 kilograms of apples every year. And we'll do 300 types of apples, 60 types of pears. We will have all the fruits. We're changing the look of the city. And coffee is part of that, as you have never imagined before. To conclude, if we're only teaching our children everything we know, our children will never do better than we have done. We need to create a large degree of freedom for children to imagine things that we cannot imagine, like fishing without nets, fishing with air bubbles, fishing so that you can save the females with eggs, so that the whole debate about fishing stock becomes a laughing stock about how we as human beings have been behaving until now. I have a commitment from the Chinese government to publish 100, 365 fables. The first 108 stories of mine, based on real projects that have been implemented, have already been published in China and are distributed free to all the children in China. The Chinese Minister of Environment Protection and the Chinese Minister of Education decided to do it after three years of investigation by the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Ladies and gentlemen, when Nestle can reach 500 million customers every day, I can now reach 340 million children every day in China. And I don't have to pay for the advertising. We need to do something very fundamental. We need to start thinking that the way we're approaching innovation is not good enough. We need to set the targets. We need to define strategies. But ladies and gentlemen, as the father of six children, I tell you, if you're not able to inspire the children with what you're doing, you're not going to change anything in this society. With the words of Nelson Mandela, it always seems impossible until it's done. Ladies and gentlemen, I leave it up to you to do with the coffee what can be done with coffee. Thank you.